three of the 20 amino acids, namely valine, methionine, and isoleucine, can all be transformed into succinyl coenzyme A, one of the intermediates of the citric acid cycle. And this molecule can be transformed into oxaloacetate via the citric acid cycle, and then inside our liver, that succinyl coenzyme A is used to generate glucose via gluco gluconeogenesis. And so that's exactly why valine, methionine, and isoleucine are known as glucogenic amino acids. But notice that before these are transformed into succinyl coenzyme A, they all converge. The pathway of metabolism of these amino acids all converge at propenyl coenzyme A. So we first transform these into propenyl coenzyme A, then that becomes methylmalonyl coenzyme A, and that ultimately is transformed into succinyl coenzyme A. So what I've outlined on the board is the pathway by which we essentially transform methionine into succinyl coenzyme A. So this will be the focus of this lecture. We're not really going to look at valine or, iso or isoleucine, but you should know that these amino acids can also be transformed into succinyl coenzyme A, just like methionine can. So there are a total of nine steps that basically take us from methionine to succinyl coenzyme A. And so let's begin with step number one. And step number one is actually a very important step because it allows us to generate an important molecule that is used by the cells of our body. And we'll see what that molecule is and why it's important just in a moment. So let's first see how we actually get there. So we begin with our methionine. Now within our methionine, this blue section will ultimately end up being part of the succinyl coenzyme A. This green section will basically be important in this molecule here, as we'll see in just a moment. So how do we get from methionine to this molecule? Well, basically, this step is catalyzed by methionine adenosyl transferase. And what this enzyme does is it takes an adenosine group from the ATP, it basically kicks off those phosphate groups and attaches that adenosine onto this sulfur. And that creates a positive charge on that sulfur as seen in this particular diagram. So this is the product of step one. We call it S-adenosylmethionine or simply SAM. Now, what's the importance of this sulfur and the positive charge on the sulfur? Well, this is basically a relatively unstable um, arrangement because we have a positive charge on this relatively electronegative sulfur atom. And so what that means is this molecule is a very good methyl donor. And that's precisely what our cells actually use this molecule for. This SAM molecule is one of the more important donors of methyl groups inside our body. And whenever we want to methylate proteins, enzymes, neurotransmitter, hormones, and so forth, we can use this SAM molecule. We can basically remove this methyl and attach it onto a target molecule. And that's exactly what happens in step two. So let's suppose we have some target molecule that we want to methylate. And so we take the SAM, we use it to actually methylate that product molecule that removes this methyl group and it forms this molecule we call S-adenosyl homocysteine. So once we remove this methyl group, there is no longer positive charge on this sulfur and so it's slightly more stable than before. The enzyme that catalyzes this process is methyltransferase. That makes sense because this enzyme catalyzes is the transfer of this, of this methyl group from SAM onto some target molecule. All right, so once we form this, what happens next? Well, in the next step, we basically want to remove that adenosine group. And so what happens is this entire group is actually removed. And the enzyme that catalyzes this is adenosyl homocysteinase. And so the product molecule that we form is the homocysteine. And notice we still have that blue section that ultimately came from here that, be, that will become part of the succinyl coenzyme A. 
Now, let's stop here for just a moment. So, before we take the homocysteine and continue on the pathway to actually generate the succinyl coenzyme A, what also could actually happen and what we should talk about is the fact that homocysteine can be used to actually regenerate that methionine. And this is an important step. And essentially, this is what we call a cycle because we begin with methionine, we move along and we generate that methionine back in the process. We also generate that SAM molecule that can be used to methylate some particular target molecule. So that that's why this step is so important, but it's also important for the following reason. What this step allows us to do when we go from homocysteine to methionine is it allows us to regenerate another important molecule known as tetrahydrofolate. So we can take a methylated tetrahydrofolate at the fifth nitrogen, so 5-methyl-THF, we essentially remove that methyl group and we regenerate that THF. And now we can use the THF in some process within our cells. And so what this step allows us to do is, number one, we regenerate that methionine. In the process, we form the SAM molecule. And we also regenerate a THF by taking a 5-methyl-THF removing that methyl and reforming that THF. And we'll talk about the importance of THF in a future lecture. So this basically comes from folic acid, our tetrahydrofolate. Now the enzyme that catalyzes the step is methionine synthase and it uses vitamin B12. And vitamin B12 is also known as cobalamin. So this is one of the few enzymes inside our body that actually utilizes vitamin B12, the other enzyme we're going to talk about at the end. So this is our cycle that allows us to basically, number one, regenerate the methionine while forming that SAM and also regenerating the THF that can be used in various processes within our body. And we'll talk about these processes in future lectures. Now, what we want to focus on in this lecture, however, is how we can use methionine and basically create homocysteine and then use that to ultimately generate the succinyl coenzyme A that can be used by our liver cells to actually generate glucose molecules. So in that particular case, the homocysteine basically undergoes a, re a reaction that is catalyzed by cystathionine beta synthase. And this enzyme uses vitamin B6 PLP, so pyridoxal phosphate. So we take a serine, we basically remove water, and we attach that serine onto this sulfur here. And we form this intermediate cystathionine. Now, cystathionine, by the activity of the enzyme cystathionine gamma lyase, will essentially be cleaved. So a water molecule will be used to basically remove that cysteine that is formed. So we essentially remove this entire molecule here, including this sulfur atom, and that gives a cysteine. And we also remove this ammonium group. And so ultimately we generate an alpha ketobutyrate, an alpha keto acid. Now notice that this also allows us to actually generate a cysteine amino acid by metabolizing methionine. So that's also important because this gives us a way to generate one amino acid by beginning with a different amino acid. And this all happens in this single pathway. So we can see that this pathway is very rich in important molecules. So we produce the SAM molecule, the methyl donor, we produce this THF from the 5-methyl-THF, and that will become important when we'll talk about the synthesis of nucleotide bases. And we also produce this cysteine shown here. So this enzyme uses vitamin B6. Again, vitamin B6 is the pyridoxal phosphate that we talked about here. And this is our alpha-keto acid. 
Now, the alpha ketobutyrate then undergoes a decarboxylation step where we essentially remove this carbon dioxide and the enzyme complex that catalyzes this is alpha ketoacid dehydrogenase complex. So we essentially remove this carbon dioxide and we attach a coenzyme A molecule. So we form this propanyl coenzyme A. Now, Recall that propanyl coenzyme A is essentially obtained uh, is obtained when we metabolize odd chain fatty acids. So the final product of the metabolism of odd chain fatty acids is in fact a propanyl coenzyme A. In the same way that we have this propanyl coenzyme A when we metabolize our methionine. So every step from this step onward is exactly the same as we discussed for the metabolism of fat ch of odd chain fatty acids. So we take the propanyl coenzyme A, the enzyme propanyl coenzyme A carboxylase. So carboxylase means it has to have a carbon source, it uses biotin, and it has to have an energy source. The carbon source is this bicarbonate, the energy source is ATP, and the biotin is a coenzyme prosthetic group that exists within the propanyl coenzyme A carboxylase. So what it does is, is it basically attaches this CO2 group onto this carbon here. And so that's exactly what we form here. So we attach it right over here. And so we form the D-methylmalonyl coenzyme A. Now in step eight, we basically change the isomer from the D-isomer to the L-isomer. And in the final step, this is the other enzyme that utilizes cobalamin, so vitamin B12. So we have methylmalonyl coenzyme A mutase. And what this enzyme does is, is it basically extends, it uses this carbon and inserts it into here, so it extends this chain by one carbon. So here we had one, two, three, now we have one, two, three, four, because this carbon was used to extend this carbon chain. And so we formed the succinyl coenzyme A as our final molecule. So we can see that the metabolism, the breakdown of the methionine to our succinyl coenzyme A is actually pretty complicated. And we see that many important intermediate molecules are formed as a result. So namely, we form the S-adenosyl methionine, which is one of the more, one of the most important uh, methyl, donor, uh, methyl donor molecules used by the cells. We reform that THF that will become important. We'll talk about uh, pyrimidine and purine synthesis. And we also form the cysteine as a byproduct. And cysteine is one of the uh, amino acids that our body uses to generate protein molecules.